Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our briefing this morning, Funding the Future, the Impact of Federal Clean Energy Investments. I'm Dan Brissett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Uh, EESI is celebrating 40 years of advancing climate solutions through congressional education. We were founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by a group of members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers and the public. What does that look like, congressional education? Well, it looks a lot like this. Uh, we do a lot of briefings. Sometimes they're in person. In fact, often they're in person. Sometimes they're virtual when it makes a lot of sense for them to be in virtual. But we do our best to pull together the best experts, leaders, practitioners uh, together to talk about environment, energy, and clean energy topics. Uh, we cover a lot of ground. Today, we're going to be talking about our good friends at the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. We featured them in previous briefings this year, but we also cover other topics. We did a briefing a few weeks ago with the Sustainable Energy, about the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook with the Business Council for Sustainable Energy in Bloomberg NEF. We also did a briefing not that long ago on the IRA and the IJ or the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. We did a progress report about the investments that are flowing through the U.S. Department of Agriculture and DOE into rural areas. Next week, we'll be back with a cool briefing about ocean carbon dioxide removal. And then after that, dam safety. After that, natural climate solutions and even more. That's a lot to keep track of, and we don't have all morning, so I'm just going to encourage everyone to sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It's really the best way to keep up with everything. And if any of those topics sounded good, you can always visit us online. All of our resources are fully are, are free and fully available to the public, and our website is www.eesi.org. We try really hard to make sure that our resources are timely, relevant, accessible, and practical. One reason why we're doing this briefing today is because it's in the wake of the president's budget request, and we're going to be talking talking about the work that DOE is able to do uh, to pull the private sector and the public sector together uh, to advance climate solutions. It's much better to, to have this information before your boss asks you about it. Uh, and we try to time our, our briefings so that uh, when things are uh, sort of in the mix in Congress, it's appropriation season, it's a good time to be learning about uh, all the great work that DOE is doing. And today, we're going to be taking a very close look at the Department of Energy's latest research and innovations in energy efficiency, renewable energy, and sustainable uh, transportation. And those things are carried out in part by the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. In particular, our panelists this morning will explain how public-private partnerships are at the heart of EERE programs and detail all the ways that federal investments in advanced technologies drive decarbonization while building a clean energy workforce, advancing environmental justice, keeping energy affordable, and laying the groundwork for the new innovations and policies that will reduce emissions while improving the energy productivity of our economy. I'm going to pop up a quick survey here. If anyone would be uh, willing to take a few moments of their day to uh, fill out our survey, we'd really appreciate that. We'll also have a link at the end of the webinar uh, or the briefing today uh, as well. There it is. Thank you, Troy. Um, before I turn it over to our first speaker of the day, I just want to mention that we're going to have time for Q&A. We're in an online audience and we're streaming via YouTube. Uh, if you have a question in our online audience, if you have a question, you have a couple different options. One, you can send it to us by email and the email address to use is ask, that's ASK, dot, uh, ASK at ESI.org. You can also um, follow us on social media at ESI online. We'll be doing real-time coverage on Blue Sky, our Instagram story, threads, and X. You can always hit us up there as well. That brings us to our first speaker of the day. Jeff Marutian is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of Energy. Jeff previously served as Senior Advisor to Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm and as Special Pre Assistant to President Biden. Jeff was also a member of the Biden-Harris Presidential Transition Team, and before joining the administration, Jeff was the Director of the District of Columbia's Department of Transportation, where he led the adoption of sustainable transportation technologies and oversaw more than $4 billion of critical infrastructure and utility projects. Jeff, welcome to the briefing this morning. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much, and I, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from these exciting panelists about the great work that they're doing. Uh, and, and let me just say how much we really appreciate EESI uh, leading these types of forums, but also just the incredible work that uh, that you all do each and every day. We certainly have come to rely on it uh, and, and know that many of our stakeholders uh, do as well. So I want to talk just very briefly, because like I said, I am really actually quite eager to hear from our, our panelists about the exciting things that that they've been able to do with, with federal resources and, and how we can collectively help drive uh, 
our climate goals, uh, because that work is just so, so important and so critical. So I'll talk just a little bit about uh, our priorities currently going forward uh, in the Department of Energy, in EERE, uh, under the leadership of our secretary, Jennifer Granholm, uh, as we all work together to, to achieve President Biden's uh, climate objectives, reaching that net zero economy uh, by 2050. We know that there are a lot of really important steps uh, that we need to take. Uh, and for us, uh, high among those is implementing the suite of laws that have fundamentally changed the game uh, for our ability to address uh, some of the hardest to abate uh, sectors. And so we're focused uh, on uh, our buildings and industry sectors, uh, the renewable energy uh, broadly, helping to enable new technologies that will help us get to, uh, to a fully decarbonized economy. And then, of course, as you mentioned, uh, sustainable transportation and uh, all the things that we know uh, we need to do in order to address that that hard hard to decarbonize and hard to abate sector. All of this also is uh, in service of making our clean energy uh, more efficient, more affordable, uh, accessible to every American across the country, uh, and strengthening our national security. Uh, by reducing uh, our dependence on foreign energy so sources. And so the innovations that we are able to spur at EERE uh, with funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, and with our uh, base appropriations have been able to fund some of the great companies that we're going to hear from today, uh, among, among many others. So for those who may not be familiar with EERE, think of us as an as a energy technology innovation engine. We are the federal government's largest investor in applied clean energy, our d and and the driving force behind the, the nation's uh, clean energy advancements uh, from that perspective. Uh, we support work that uh, has helped bring a number of new technologies to life and also has helped support furthering uh, technologies like solar and wind and helping to make them more efficient uh, and some of the lowest co cost sources of, of clean energy. Uh, we, of course, partner with uh, many of our network of 17 national labs uh, who are leading much of that research and development uh, across the board. Uh, and so we're really proud of, of the work that we're, that we're able to accomplish in partnership uh, with them. So a couple of just very quick priorities that I'll, I'll talk about. The, the grid, uh, decarbonizing the grid, getting to a 100% to a clean electricity uh, by 2035 is a priority for us, and we are taking steps across EERE and across the Department of Energy uh, to help reach uh, that, that milestone. We're also, as I mentioned, prioritizing sectors like the agriculture sector, uh, buildings and industry. We just released a comprehensive uh, building decarbonization strategy, uh, and that pairs well with the, uh, the comprehensive transportation decarbonization strategy uh, that, we, that we released uh, last year. Each of those priorities is aligned with one of the research pillars uh, that we that we lead. So our sustainable transportation and fuels uh, pillar, for example, covers everything from electric vehicles to biofuels to hydrogen. Uh, and they also uh, partner with the Department of Transportation to, to oversee the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation to deliver on President Biden's commitment of 500,000 publicly available uh, charging stations uh, by 2030. Our renewable energy office oversees a wide range of clean energy generation like solar, geothermal, which we're excited to hear about today, water, uh, wind power, uh, and all the technologies that we know we need to enable and integrate uh, those things onto the grid and into our system. Uh, and so uh, those, are, those are some of, I mentioned our buildings and industry pillar, which is focused on everything from advanced materials and manufacturing uh, to building materials and, and building envelopes. So We've got a lot of work happening across the board in each of those areas. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, there are two things that are key for us. One is the, the president's leadership and, and Secretary Granholm's leadership as we implement these historic laws. Uh, and another key thing for us are partnerships, partnerships with companies, with academic institutions, uh, with organizations like EESI uh, to help us further our reach. We also partner very closely with state and local governments, with tribes, uh, to, to ensure that our resources are hitting every single community across the country. Uh, and as I think many of you know, equity and the work that we're doing uh, around energy justice are priorities for our office at EERE, along with the entirety of the Department of Energy. Uh, and so we're keenly focused uh, on making sure that everything we do 
uh, has the reach of, of really hitting every American community. That is reflected in the work that we lead uh, in our energy earth shots. It's reflected in, in the work that we are doing as we put out funding opportunities uh, for a lot of the technology areas that you'll hear about today. So I could talk for hours about the work that we do and about how exciting it is to be a part of it, but I'm super excited to hear from these panelists. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Daniel. Thanks, Jeff. That was a great overview. And thanks for saying nice things about ESI. I'll reciprocate. You have a tremendous team over at ERE. They are a great uh, group of folks to work with. Uh, and we've also, in addition to having you here today, uh, want to give a couple shout outs to Alejandro and Carolyn and Sunita and Mandy, who've been part of uh, ESI Congressional Education just in the last year or so. So really uh, amazing group of folks you have over there and um, uh, really always pleased to have a chance to work with you all. Um, so, Jeff, happy you're going to be able to stick around with us for the rest of the panel. We are going to introduce uh, our other panelists. I'm going to introduce them all at once, uh, and then I'm going to ask them a question to kick off their conversation and allow them to say a little bit more about how they're working uh, with ERE. So uh, our first of three uh, panelists today will be uh, Tom Michaels. Tom is the Director of Government, Re uh, Government Affairs for United Airlines. He covers both federal and state government affairs and leads all advocacy related to climate and sustainability issues. Before that, Tom worked at Blue Water Strategies, a D.C.-based government affairs and business consultancy focused on energy and environmental issues and served as executive director of the One Foundation, a coalition of natural gas companies focused on reducing methane emissions. Then we will hear from Alexandra Bailey-Smith. Alex is the lead uh, strategy lead for Fervo, a next generation geothermal company. Uh, Alex leads a team focused on strategic initiatives, corporate strategy, and diversification opportunities for geothermal heat and power. Before joining Fervo, Alex worked in upstream oil and gas operations, mega capital projects, and technology ventures domestic uh, technology venture roles domestically and internationally for Chevron. And then last but certainly not least, Kiran Mancharaju is the Vice President of Research at South Wire Company, North America's foremost wire and cable company. Uh, Kiran leads the innovation hub based at Georgia Tech. Uh, he also oversees collaborations with academia, national laboratories, and startups. His focus on introducing sustainable projects or products through public and private partnerships underscores his and Southwire's commitment to advancing products and processes that reduce carbon emissions and uh, in those partnerships, Kieran and his team are leading the growth of the wire and cable industry by developing functionalized materials and technologies. So that's a lot. Good time to remind everybody that uh, the webcast, as well as presentation materials and biographical information, will be available on our website at www.esi.org. And Troy, who's behind the scenes today, is also going to be reminding everyone of names and affiliations uh, as we go through the panel. So I hope everyone keep track uh, of this great discussion. So that uh, leads me to the sort of kickoff question. Tom, we'll start with you and then we'll hear from Alex and Kiran. Um, how has funding uh, from the from ERE, uh, especially investments in research and development, helped United Airlines achieve something that otherwise you might not have been able to achieve on your own? So thanks for the question, Daniel, and thanks so much for having me here. I'm a big fan of EESI. When I was on Capitol Hill, I sat through many uh, many an EESI briefing and learned a lot uh, about the work that I continue to do every day here. So really appreciate you having me on. With respect to um, uh, your question, I may be in a slightly different position than than some of the other panelists here. United Airlines is not a a grantee or a, um, a direct funding fundee of the Department of Energy. Um, however, we consider ourselves a, a very active and engaged partner with, um, with ERE, uh, most notably through the work that the department has led on the SAF Grand Challenge. SAF for the uninitiated is sustainable aviation fuel. Um, and uh, it's it's critically important to United Airlines. Um, here's why: United is a big company. We're in a hard to abate sector. Um, just to give you some context, um, we used about four billion gallons of jet fuel last year, and the year before, and the year before, um, and that jet fuel 
the combustion of that jet fuel accounts for 98% of our emissions. So even though we have about 100,000 people and facilities all across the country and vehicles uh, on the ground all across the country, all of that adds up to only 2% of our emissions portfolio. All the rest is um, about the, the fuel that we burn in our, in our uh, aircraft. And so how do we get that down? Um, electric aircraft um, are potentially uh, potentially a viable solution for, for short uh, haul, maybe 200 miles or less flights. Um, but beyond that, there really isn't any immediate alternative to jet fuel. You need something that is uh, chemically indistinguishable from jet fuel. Uh, but on a life cycle basis has lower emissions. And that's what sustainable aviation fuel is. Instead of using uh, oil to, uh, to make your jet fuel, you use a different kind of feedstock that has a lower carbon footprint. Uh, today, we use an awful lot of used cooking oil, um, as well as waste fats and greases from, from uh, uh, you know, chicken processing and beef processing. Um, and uh, we expect to use some, some energy crops in the future. And we also expect to hopefully use captured gases um, and, and renewable power to, to create uh, these in the future. So um, what's the role of the Department of Energy in this? One, they've put out a roadmap here with the SAF Grand Challenge. They set a, a challenge to the industry, which we have accepted. Um, to try and get roughly 10% of our total fuel use uh, to be sustainable aviation fuel by 2030. That's a lot. It's 3 billion gallons. Uh, to give you some context, United was the largest consumer of sustainable aviation fuel in the world last year, and we used 7 million gallons. That's with an M. Um, and so we just need to get that up a little bit to <laughs> say about a billion um, over uh, the next uh, slightly less than a decade. So um, it, is a, it is a huge challenge. We're well outside of our comfort zone. And what EERE does is they're helping us to create an ecosystem of commercially viable SAF producers out there. Uh, it's a nascent industry, still quite, quite a bit in its infancy. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to make jet, uh, sustainable aviation fuel or SAF, um, and uh, none of them are what you would call fully tested and proven from an investment standpoint. Um, Wall Street and others still remain um, in, in kind of wait and see mode. And so uh, United Airlines is stepping in. We have our own corporate venture fund that uh, goes out and identifies promising technologies and we invest directly in those companies. But uh, EERE has stepped forward with a number of different grant programs that have provided critical capital to many of our fueling partners. Alder, Bi Alder, Alder Bioenergy is one of them. They're gonna be using a really interesting technology developed by the way at one of DOE's national labs. Um, and it, it's a fast pyrolysis process that will use uh, uh, intense heat under pressure in an oxygen-free environment to take biofeedstocks, um, in this case wood chips, and um, chemically convert them into uh, high-grade, uh, low-carbon jet fuel. Um, DOE has also funded a, a company that we're not a partner with, but we are definitely rooting uh, to succeed. That's Lanza Jet. They just uh, opened their, their project in Soperton, Georgia. Uh, really promising technology that uh, will take ethanol, low carbon ethanol, and using a, uh, a bioprocess, convert that ethanol into um, a more energy dense uh, jet fuel. And so those are just a couple of examples. Um, United is a, uh, has active commercial interest in this space, but we know that we're not gonna be able to, to move this market uh, on our own. We really are uh, reliant on these kinds of public-private partnerships with the department um, and some of the other federal agencies to help put in place, one, the policies that are necessary to get these emerging technologies off the ground, 
uh, to provide some of that critical funding and uh, no small part to provide the R&D as well. Um, the technical know-how, um, the, the uh, incubation of, invest, of, of, uh, of these technologies at the national labs and in other uh, quarters. And um, they've been great partners for us. And uh, there's no way that we would be as far as we are without the department. And uh, we hope to see that, um, that focus and investment continue to grow and uh, seeing every signal of that. So I think I'll, I'll pause there and let some of the others chime in. That's great, Tom. Thank you so much for that presentation. We have one of our most popular written resources is a sustainable aviation fuel and sustainable aviation uh, issue brief that our uh, colleague, uh, fellow Jeff Overton wrote. So that would be, if anyone wants to do a deeper dive, we have some some really great stuff on that. But um, yeah, it's impressive to see what United is able to do. That brings us to you, Alex. Uh, really, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Welcome to the briefing this morning. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, hi, everyone. I would like to start off by thanking EESI for including Fervo in the conversation today. Um, like Dan said, my name is Alex Smith, and I am the strategy lead at Fervo. We are a next-generation geothermal power developer leveraging proven oil and gas technologies to produce 24-7 clean firm power. Um, just to level set everyone, I want to start with a quick overview of geothermal and what we do. And then I'll move on to focusing on how instrumental the EERE has been in our development story. So at a high level, geothermal uses heat from the earth to produce steam to run a turbine. For geothermal to work, you need three things. You need fluid, you need permeability or a way for that fluid to flow, and then you need hot rock. Folks often picture the geysers, <clears throat> the geysers in Iceland um, this is the oldest and most traditional form of geothermal, where all three of these things are found very close to the surface. This powers their entire economy with practically zero emissions. I'm very, very jealous. Um, however, this combination is limited to a very small geographic area. Most countries do not have access to this. Over time, developers have been able to address this need for fluid by taking water at the surface and pumping it subsurface. That means that you still need to search for that natural permeability in hot rock. So unfortunately, this is still only found in a limited number of geographies. The other downside of operating in this manner is those natural fractures are very hard to model and they're very hard to control. So we have seen multiple examples in the geothermal industry of geothermal operators pumping water subsurface, expecting it to flow one way, back to surface where it would produce power, but unfortunately they, it dissipates to the reservoir. This ultimately destroys the performance of these projects, which translates into poor economics, which ultimately has hurt, you know, made a challenging reputation for the industry. This is a primary reason geothermal makes up such a small fraction of power production today, even though it's a clean, firm, and really highly needed source of power. Fervo is addressing these challenges by producing our own fractures. We're basically avoiding those natural ones. Our technology deploys proven fracking techniques from the shale revolution to create our own controlled flow path subsurface. And this connects our injection wells to our production wells. This makes it so that we are only looking for hot rock and opens us up wide to wide uh, a wide number of geographies. This also drastically reduces that performance risk um, associated with traditional geothermal. geothermal. With existing drilling technologies that are available today, this unlocks reserves of over 300 gigawatts in the United States alone. So the size of prize is huge. Um, Fervo has proven out the technology at our, our commercial scale pilot in Nevada. This is a 3.5 megawatt project selling, uh, it co-developed with Google. Um, and now we are developing our first 400 megawatt commercial scale project in Southwest Utah. I'm excited to be here today to share more about the massive impact that the EERE has had on Fervo's development and the geothermal industry as a whole. And I'm also looking forward to sparking some dialogue on how we can continue to collaborate to maximize the pace of the energy transition in a just and equitable way. So now I'll actually answer the question. Um, the EERE and specifically within it, the Geothermal Technologies Office has been instrumental in helping Fervo get to where it is today. To prove out our technology in the field, we have to spend millions of dollars of CapEx or capital upfront 
to confirm a resource to understand if a project is viable. We can't just go out and look. Um, so early stage funding by the federal government in a time where a project is not financeable is really, really important for our industry. This is where the federal government can play a pivotal role to getting clean technologies off the ground. But another important lever beyond direct funding is the indirect funding that we have seen through Utah Forge. So Utah Forge is a program that was put in place to push EGS, Enhanced Geothermal Systems, forward. They have stimulated growth in geothermal in three ways. First, they've been leaders in the technology exchange. They are operating in Southwest Utah, testing out different drilling techniques, different materials, you, you name it. Um, and then they publish this information publicly. Fervo used the, the learnings from Utah Forge and applied them directly in our pilot project, Project Red. And then this allowed, this served as a proof point for follow on capital. Second, as I mentioned, exploration is a riskier part of our business. Um, Utah Forge characterized the resource out in Southwest Utah so well that it made Furbo comfortable enough to pick up a really large acreage position. And effectively this allowed us to de-skip a very risky exploration drilling stage. And then finally, once we decided that we wanted to build Project Cape in Southwest Utah, Forge was hugely helpful in teaching us how to build local engagement across the state. That seeded our approach, which we have since made our own and developed in our own way, but Forge helped us learn how to engage with the community the right way the first time. So as you can see, for us had a longstanding relationship with the EERE, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about it. Thanks, Alex. Uh, really interesting how EERE was able to help you with that community engagement piece. Like, you might not expect that from, you know, an innovation uh and an R and D and you know driver of all these cool technologies, but you know ERE's ability to help under you know help orient them to the community is is really interesting. So really glad you brought that up. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to um, since we were just talking with you, Alex. I'm also going to plug a briefing we did a couple months ago now with David Turk, who's the Deputy Energy Secretary on Energy Earthshots. Uh, Carolyn Snyder with ERE was part of that briefing, and geothermal was definitely something that came up. So if you want to, anyone who'd like to uh, take a closer look at the Earthshots, the eight of those, uh, that would be a really great briefing for you to check out. And we're covering lots of really interesting ground, lots of cool technologies and cool uh, innovations. People have any questions for our panelists? You can ask us those questions one of two ways. You can follow us on social media at EESI online. You can also send us an email, and the email address to use is askask at eesi.org. Kieran, that brings us to you. Uh, really eager to hear your presentation. Welcome to the briefing, and I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, Dan, and I really appreciate uh, your inviting uh, Southwire and myself specifically to this team. Uh, really excited about the partnerships that we have been working with the ERE from Southwire and also the different labs that they facilitate. I'm going to keep my uh, remarks a little cryptic for two reasons. One is uh, I'm going to be sensitive to everybody's time. Two is I don't want to get myself into too much trouble. So uh, based on that, let's talk a little bit about, I'll start off with uh, what is Southwire. Southwire is the largest uh, privately held company. We are the largest cable manufacturer in the uh, in North America, probably the second or the third in the world, depends on uh, uh, time of the day. And uh, within that, we, uh, if you look at our uh, business, uh, uh, we have 80% of our business is wire and cable. We uh, generate or uh, we make uh, every kind of cable from your power generation plants to your receptacles in your home. And as we look uh, at outside of the immediate uh, uh, transmission and distribution part of the cable business, we also are looking into megatrends, which is where, you know, some of the work that EERE is doing, partnering with us, is just been tremendously helpful. And in that uh, sense, we're talking about mass transit, electric vehicles, we're talking about convergence of data and power, we're talking about grids of the future. Now, uh, within, uh, you know, there is a sustainability. Sustainability is not just a buzzword for us at South Bar anymore. Our CEOs, our board, our COOs and SVPs and everybody else involved has a, a, a plan for sustainability. And the goal for us is in the next four to five years, we're going to be all our operations are going to be net zero on our carbon emissions from different plants. 
Now, uh, I'm pretty good at uh, delegating upwards. So when I talk about strategy with the ERI, with uh, uh, governmental funding, national labs and all that, uh, I kick it up a little bit to all our um, uh, CEOs and <laughs> our senior staff and in which we have a cadence that we set up uh, and how to work with some of the great funding opportunities, some of the great research opportunities that come out of uh, these national labs. And the way we have been interacting so far is it's not been purely transactional. We love what they do. We love the funding that comes, but we're also interested in, uh, you know, we, uh, some of the implications for us are societal. And when you talk about uh, advanced materials, for example, the, the work uh, that's coming out of the national labs, is, especially on the conceptual level or the fundamental level of physics, it's really mind numbing. So, uh, you know, we, um, I can go on and on and talk about the different kinds of materials innovations, uh, how we will work with national labs. I'll mention two. One is something that we have already incorporated based upon the funding through the governmental agencies such as the ERE. And one of the things that we have done is um, working with the researchers out of uh, Oak Ridge National Labs. Actually, we developed what is called uh, grain refining. You know, uh, if you look at South Park today, we make about a billion pounds of copper uh, a year and we make about uh, half a billion or more uh, pounds of aluminum a year. And these are really, really energy intensive. And if you look, and we divide that up into three areas. One is the scope one emissions, can we reduce those? And that's really aspirational at this point of time. And then the other one is the scope two and three. So one of the fundings that we had with, uh, with the Oak Ridge Labs through the governmental agency was developing, can we eliminate some of these harmful chemicals that come into manufacturing of aluminum, for example, and we are proud to say today we have eliminated 80% of what is called titanium borides out of our uh, aluminum manufacturing that has resulted. I mean, when you look at the numbers, I mean, it doesn't seem to be staggering. I mean, 2000 metric tons or uh, metric tons of carbon out of the <laughs> atmosphere is not huge, but we now that falls into our whole sustainability uh, ideas. So that, that, kind of develops the framework of where we are going. Uh, so th we really appreciate the work that's been done at the foundational level, especially from the work that is being done. So we started the fundamental level of where the Oak Ridge Labs and the guys, the brilliant scientists that they do based upon the work that they're doing, based upon the money that they're getting from EERE, we are then able to take some of these concepts and translate them into useful products that we can build into our cables. Now, the second part, as I said, is more aspirational. If you look at the way we manufacture aluminum and copper today, you take solid, like cathode or anode, you melt it, and then you re-solidify it and turn it into wire and cables that goes into your products. Now, if there is a way, and this brilliant guys from these labs came back and said, if we can convert something from solid to solid without the melting step in between, now that would be energy savings. So we made some, you know, we had some federal grants from it. We uh, partnered with these uh, laboratories. And now at this point of time, we are happy to say that we are planning on uh, scaling up this uh, opportunity. So again, this is really aspirational. We love the uh, part. And, uh, you know, we look forward to continuing to engage with the ERE and other government agencies and uh, national labs. Back to you, Dan. Thanks. That was a great presentation. Jeff, before we move on, lots of uh, really interesting things from Tom and Alex and Kieran. Do you have any uh, commentary or response to what you just heard before we move through the rest of the questions? Nothing specific other than, you know, some of the things that, that were just discussed are things that we are excited about, too. Uh, and uh, and and I think that the levels of partnership and, and our ability to collaborate uh, is is important and, and really enabled by um, by by a lot of folks who have been leading this, uh, you know, in, in these areas for a long time. So, uh, really exciting stuff. Awesome. All right. So, Alex, I'm gonna I'm, I'm keeping an eye on our online questions. If anyone has them, there's still plenty of time. We still have 26 ish minutes or so. Um, but I'd like to start this next question maybe with you, Alex, and then we can hear from Kieran and Mike. And that is about workforce. So. 
geothermal wells don't dig themselves. Uh, these structures don't build themselves, right? Um, and so the workers that actually do this work uh, for you know a decarbonized clean energy economy are absolutely essential, more than essential. Uh, how has ERE helped workers in the geothermal sector uh, be part of the energy transition? And what are some opportunities maybe where even closer partnerships could help prepare the geothermal sector workforce for you know the rest of the 21st century? Um, thank you for the question. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, so geothermal is good for the climate. Geothermal is good for domestic energy security, but maybe most important, or at least most personally, uh, it is really, really good for jobs. Um, we, we know that the EERE wants oil and gas workers to be part of next generation geothermal. We see this through programs like Geode, um, and we appreciate the motivation behind these programs. From the Fervo perspective, though, geothermal is a place where oil and gas workers can seamlessly transition with very minimal additional training. Um, Fervo is a really, really good example of this. Over 50% of our office staff and field labor um, come directly from the oil and gas industry, myself included. Um, and so we believe that the best way to build up, uh, you know, this geothermal workforce and use uh, leverage those the skill set from the oil and gas industry is to build more geothermal. You know, we see it every day as Fervo gets bigger, we have more jobs to offer, and we hire more oil and gas workers. Um, so we would just encourage the EERE to put more money in the core operations of the industry because it inherently is supporting workers through the energy transition. Karen, let's hear from you next about sort of workforce and your uh, your industry and what maybe some opportunities to do even more. Sure. Now, uh, Jeff kind of kicked it off talking about the renewables part of it, and that is a tremendous uh, part of where our strategy is now concentrating on. If you look at our industry today, it's very energy intensive. I mean, the way we transmit power and electricity is these huge transmission lines that go millions of miles. Uh, that's an exaggeration, thousands of miles. And then as you distribute this electricity and power, the new renewables that are coming in are more important. For example, wind, solar, now hydrogen is an aspect that uh, really important for us. So you're talking distributed energy, the way energy transition is going to happen is uh, it's going to go away, um, hopefully, uh, in the future where you're transmitting power across thousands of miles to where you're talking about individual grids, grids being manufactured at the local level. And so these uh, concepts of fundamental resources, research into uh, studies in, and I'll specifically mention hydrogen, we are working with uh, the labs and you know understanding where they are on uh, wind and solar, but I'll talk about hydrogen for a little bit. Now, if you talk about hydrogen, uh, companies such as Southwire make wire and cable really, really well. We know our stuff. We know how to commercialize it. We know how to make a safe product. We know how to engineer value into our products. However, when you talk about hydrogen, you have to step back. We have to step back a little bit because we don't understand it as well. So if you look at our product lines today, our goal, our, our process is safety, quality, and productivity in that order. So if you talk about hydrogen, we don't know much about it. And that is where uh, company, our labs and the support uh, that comes from the governmental agencies is coming in. And so the new workforce that is going to come in, we, uh, we have our guys who know how to make wire and cable, as I said, using the existing fossil fuels, using natural gas and all the stuff that we use today. But the new innovations that are going to come in is going to create a new generation of uh, need for new people. And this is where these partnerships are going to go, because the work that is being done uh, at the foundational level at these labs, for example, and we are able to communicate and even academic institutions for that matter. And I, you know, one of the things that we have interacted with, with these governmental agencies or with these national labs is some of these researchers, brilliant researchers are now starting startup companies from the work that they're able to do. And now we have been able to communicate, work with these uh, startup companies to scale up. And as we scale up, we are also able to get the staff that's, that we're gonna need, the workers that we're gonna need 
who understand hydrogen, for example, who understand the safety issues, the quality issues, the productivity issues. So I think this public-private partnerships is going to be huge because we are very good at what we do today. But to take us to the next level, I think we really need the input from uh, these fundings and these partnerships. Back to you. That's a really great point. Uh, Tom, SAF industry, uh, curious about sort of, you know, where things are and, and maybe where some opportunities are for, um, you know, for even more workforce development to, to strengthen that. Um, you bet. Um, yeah. So I'm, I might just add one that it's not just sustainable aviation fuel. We, while that is sort of our biggest focus, um, we are looking to decarbonize our entire operation. Um, United is is an uh, industry leader, for example, in uh, electrification of our ground service equipment. We call them GSEs for short, but that refers to all those funny little vehicles that you see uh, driving around the airport tarmac, whether they're pulling the baggage carts or uh, pulling planes. Um, they call these tugs, and um, those, those vehicles... Um, along with all the jet engines that are going, are all emitting a lot of uh, not just carbon, but also other uh, particulate matter into the air. Um, and, and air quality in and around airports is always a significant concern. And one of the big things that we can do to alleviate that is to electrify uh, those vehicles. And so um, as we're doing that, we have been... Um, First of all, we need the electrification infrastructure. We need the charging infrastructure there to make them work. And then we need all our maintenance uh, technicians to be uh, capable in how to operate them, how to work on them, how to fix them. And so that's that's a big part of our transition. Um, so we, we started uh, just over a year ago a new apprenticeship. It's called our Calibrate Apprenticeship, and it's for our maintenance technicians. Um, so there, there are sort of three tracks on it. One of them is for our uh, aviation maintenance technician. These are our aircraft mechanics. It takes a long time to become an aircraft mechanic, and typically it involves at least two years of schooling and about fifty to seventy thousand in tuition. Um, we we needed to train a lot more of these people and relatively quickly. Um, and we needed to break down barriers for the many talented folks to, to come in. And so one way of doing that was to start our own in-house apprenticeship. It's a three-year apprenticeship. We did it in conjunction with the Department of Labor, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. And so uh, we're, we're setting off down that work. And it's not just for those technicians that work on the aircraft, but also those who work on our facilities and on our GSEs, our ground service equipment. And so uh, when the Department of Energy used funding provided by the bipartisan infrastructure law to fund uh, what they call industrial assessment centers, these are partner entities, uh, community colleges, labor unions, um, and other technical schools that we partner with um, that's been a, a big help. It's, again, one, expanding the, the pool of uh, high skill, but generally not college path uh, labor out there. Um, these are folks that we are actively and aggressively recruiting. These are um, high skill jobs. They're, they're well paid. You can support a family on them. And um, but the, the training is critical, right? And so the more of these uh, institutions that can um, get fully funded, um, the better. And, and DOE is an important funding partner. They're also, of course, an important knowledge partner in transmitting uh, what kind of skills are going to be needed, what kind of infrastructure obviously is going to be needed, and, and how to integrate that with all of our existing infrastructure in a relatively seamless way so that our customers don't notice anything but hopefully uh, a little bit cleaner air the next time they're at the airport. Great. Thanks. All those little carts, moving pretzels, <laughs> little bags of peanuts uh, <laughs> and suitcases. They, all they important. Need to <laughs> yes, they're all very important. Um, I'm going to move on to our next question. And, and Jeff, I'll include you in this one uh, as well. But we'll start with Kieran this time. Uh, and then we'll hear from uh, Tom and Alex, and then Jeff, I'd be interested to hear your comments as well. This one's a little bit more forward-looking. I'm curious 
um, or you know how sustained investment from you know has sustained investments in ERE by Congress, but sustained in, uh, investments by ERE in all of this great work. Uh, helping companies like yours advance climate solutions. What is the outlook for maybe the next two to five years? What are the things that are you know just starting today that if we had this briefing again in a couple of years, you would be able to tout as successes that you know sort of specifically stem from the investments that ERE are making or is making? Uh, give you a little uh, background here first. Uh, if you look at the way the demand on energy is going to increase as more and more uh, appliances, everything is connected. It becomes uh, it becomes imperative that we uh, take care of the present. That means we have a grid infrastructure that exists today. That is some of the overlines that you see are maybe a hundred years old, right? So as you look at transmission uh, today, and I'm going to concentrate on the transmission part of it, you see we are transmitting power over uh, you know huge distances. And so the line losses uh, as you transmit power is inversely uh, directly proportional to the amount of distance you travel. So even as uh, EERE and companies like ourselves look at renewables and other areas that we can integrate where we can look at microgrids and we can look at distributed energy in a different angle, as we sit here today, uh, the reality is that we are transmitting power over long distances and there are line losses in other areas that we need to take care of. And so based on a couple of things, so the investments that EERE is making are great. Again, on the fundamental level, you know, companies such as ourselves, we can take care of immediate when we talk about product development, you're taking a look at one, two years, right? When you look at the work that is coming out of the labs or academia, they are looking at solutions uh, to transmit more power on the existing uh, lines. That's one way to do it. I mean, you can get new right of ways. I mean, that gets into this whole uh, compliance and regulatory issue that you know, I'm not really good at talking about that, but let's talk about the existing power lines. If you have the existing power lines, if you can do advanced materials, and that's where we are working with labs and academia, and we have certain projects that we have in place. So if you take a look at it about two to five years, the goal is to develop a te uh, technology, it could be a coding, it could be new material synthesis, it could be any of the, or all of the above, where we'll put new materials on the lines, which will carry more power uh, without changing, without having new right of ways and all that. So that is where the public-private partnership is really critical. And probably this is, may not be the forum uh, to talk about this. However, in the next two to five years, we expect to have a couple of lines with this new, it could be coatings, as I said, it could be new material synthesis, again, uh, facilitated by this partnership with uh, the labs and academia, again, facilitated through the offices of EERA. That's and very cool. My Thank opinion, it looks great. I mean, we are excited in two to five years, we, you know, we want to continue to improve the grid as it exists today, even as we look forward to the new technologies on renewables and everything else that's coming on picture. Yeah. Back to you, Dan. Great, thank you so much, uh, Tom. Couple years. What are the investments you know that are that are being made today? What could they be resulting in in that you know medium term, near and medium term time horizon? That's a tough one for me because uh, our our investments tend to have a pretty long lead time. Um, a lot of SAF project developers will say that their their project is going to be ready in in two years and our, our experience is that it's a little bit longer typically um but thankfully uh first of all some of these uh DOE investments and our investments were made um, quite a while ago and are are yielding fruit um our our friends at fulcrum bioenergy who are able to convert municipal solid waste into uh, low carbon fuel um they they had a plant that's that's had some startups and 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 slowdowns uh but we expect them to be recommence uh production very soon um so it, it's a process there's there's no silver bullet that's going to change the world in the next two to five years um sustained levels of funding for key uh, government partners i think are are important over time um so uh but there's no question that the investments that have come out of the 
uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the bipartisan infrastructure law that are um, behind some of these initiatives are going to yield significant fruit. If nothing else, we're finally attracting real um, private sector investment into these uh, categories because they see that um, the department is stepping in and de-risking them in a lot of ways. So uh, absolutely essential. And um, my 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 hopes are, are very high. My expectations are somewhat more modest. Um, but I, I think that we will start seeing um, our sustainable aviation fuel output uh, roughly double each year as it did last year from the year prior. Um, and, and hopefully triple uh, within uh, the next two to three years, because it really needs to, if we're going to be able to meet these goals and challenges that we've set ourselves. Great. Thanks. And, and Alex, curious to hear how you think from, from Furbo's perspective, what the next couple of years might look like thanks to these investments. Sure. I'll uh, maybe start by painting a little bit of a picture. You know, Furbo is still early in our development, right? Our costs are still high. This 400 megawatt uh, project is going to be, it's going to cost in the, the billions uh, for CapEx. Um, we're a new company in an industry that's got a, I don't know, confusing reputation. Um, and so we are overall taking on greater burden of early stage capital deployment. Um, so the way we handle that is we raise VC money at a company equity level, super expensive way to do it, but we are doing it. And we've shown a really, you know, a strong track record of being able to to do it. We also have positive momentum in the project finance community, but at the end of the day, we don't actually have that project finance yet, right? And everything that I just described is all talking about one project. In reality, we have gigawatts of resource that are available right now, and then we simultaneously have gigawatts of demand that is available right now. They're banging down our door. Um, so the market and the tech are there. We're just slowed by access to capital. And you know, specifically geothermal and fervo, we're, we're dancing in this, we're too new, we're not new enough area because we kind of blur the lines between R&D and deployment. And again, kind of a confusing reputation for the industry and all this, you know, there's an, uh, many reasons for it. Um, but I see this as the sweet spot for government support of game-changing technology. Um, so basically what I would like to see for the future is I, I want to just emphasize the need for flexible investment from the EERE to support both R&D, but also deployment to really ignite this industry and bring on clean firm as fast as possible. To me, it's a, it's the, it's a speed game, so. And Jeff, if you have any comments or responses or feedback about sort of, you know, how you see things playing out based on your ability to, or an ERE's ability to, you know, make these investments and then sustain them over the next couple of years. Yeah, well, I'll just pick up on a couple of the threads that each of the panelists just just shared. And, and you know, we think about when we look at the, the global clean energy market, we see over the next decade, by the, by the end of, of this decade, we see it valued at uh, an estimated $23 trillion. And so much of the investment uh, that's been made already since, since Bill and, and IRA have become law uh, is is working. We're we're seeing those investments made by uh, by private industry uh, to to meet the uh, to to meet the moment uh, and, and to meet those public investments. And I have the great fortune. I'm currently on the road right now, looking at some clean energy projects. I have the fortune of traveling uh, along with my colleagues across the country to see where this work is creating jobs with the opening of of so many hundreds of new manufacturing facilities. You know, uh, Tom mentioned Lanzajet. Uh, our team had the opportunity to go to, to their uh, to their opening in Georgia just a couple of months ago to see the investments that are being made and how much economic development they're bringing to the community. Uh, and so that for for us is is just really exciting. And and that work is is only going to continue to grow as we make more and more of those investments. Uh, and you know, I think I, I think Fervo is a great example uh, of how we're kind of we're, we're seeing this in real time. We're, we're, we're seeing how uh, the, the the importance and the urgency of doing everything that we can to bring the cost down of these technologies so that we can uh, help commercialize and scale them so that they can reach more people. 
Uh, and, and that's uh, that's the exciting part of, of doing this work across so many different uh, sectors of the economy. So uh, really, really great to hear uh, to hear all this uh, all this feedback and, and hear the, the uh, great work that's being done with with federal resources and, and with federal support broadly. All right. Well, we have just enough time for a lightning round. So, uh, Tom, uh, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll hear from Alex and Kieran and then we'll give Jeff the last word today. Um, this is like, you know, 30 ish seconds, 40 ish seconds. But um, our congressional audience today, are, our you know, congressional staff watching this briefing today. Um, what's one takeaway you would like them to leave this briefing with about ERE, about how ERE and companies like yours uh, work together and, um, and, and, and achieve more by working together. Goal setting, knowledge partners, and obviously funding, um, with respect to funding, I'll just say, you know, Alexandra alluded to this, there's virtually no project finance out there for the kinds of emerging energy technologies that, that a lot of us are behind. Um, there's a good amount of venture funding out there. Um, where DOE really can play a, a, a big role is in this sort of middle tranche of like demonstration pilot plant uh, funding. Um, and so that we, we view that that role that they're doing as absolutely critical. And obviously all the the knowledge and technology development at the labs um, and elsewhere, it's just ab absolutely essential to uh, maintaining US competitiveness. Alex, lightning round over to you. Um, I would say, you know, the EERE plays a really important role bridging uh, national labs and industry and navigating that life cycle between R&D and deployment. And I think it works the best when the EERE involves industry and there's like this back and forth dynamic. Um, and so I, I would just encourage, you know, folks listening on this call to think about the EERE beyond the lab or academic setting, but in an even more broad, like a broader sense, right? The magic happens when the EERE is able to meet the industry, you know, where it's at between that R&D and deployment. That's a great point. And Karen, uh, lightning round over to you. Sure. Um, companies such as ours, you know, we have a small R and a big D. Uh, so when you look at, so if you take a look at the work that is being done out of labs or uh, academia, you're talking basic research. We are very good on the development cycles, scaling up, working with partnerships, commercializing. We understand those things really well. Not so comfortable on the basic research. However, if the physics is developed at the conceptual level really, really well, which is they have been doing, and we develop these partnerships in a more sustained, strategic way, not just you know uh, scatter shot this thing, but uh, and that is on us. And that's what we are trying to do. And any help we can get from EERE and other governmental agencies would be great. Thanks. And Jeff, we'll give you the last word today. Great. Well, thanks so much. Huge thanks to EESI for hosting this and for all the work that, that you do. Um, these panelists are really exciting. And, and I think um, this conversation go, can go on for, for a while. And um, I, I just want to say, and I'll sort of double click on what Alex said, that our our ability to be successful is really contingent on our ability to, to continue to partner. Uh, and that means partnering with uh, with uh, folks in in the government on the hill with with our colleagues in other agencies, helping to further President Biden's whole of government strategy, which we've really seen be successful in a number of ways. Uh, and then partnering partnering with folks out uh, out in communities across the country. And so really just encourage uh, those uh, who are watching this, if you haven't had any inter interaction with our office uh, or with the department broadly, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Our team at EERE uh, is looking for that collaboration. We're eager to, uh, to be a part of the work that you're doing. Uh, and I think I can speak for my colleagues across DOE uh, that, that we really want to be able to support the full spectrum of work, everything from that basic science, that basic R&D, all the way to full scale, uh, large deployments, uh, and in in some cases, enabling uh, the capacity for companies to to get loans from the department. So, uh, really exciting stuff. Appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you, and and hope to do more of these. Great. Well, thank you so much, and Tom and Alex and Kieran, thank you for joining us today and being tremendous panelists and sharing your ideas and insights and perspectives on uh, on on um, sort of the developing clean energy sector uh, that your companies represent. So, thank you for being great panelists, Jeff. 
thanks for joining us. Uh, and um, it was a real delight to have you and feature you on the briefing today. Also, huge thanks to everyone at ERE who helped make today's briefing possible and your participation possible. So um, thanks. It's always a delight to work with uh, with your team on that. So thank you very much. Um, uh, and, and I'm definitely speaking for all of ESI when I when I say all of this for sure. Uh, it's been uh, this has been a great panel to put together. I'd also like thanks. to say thanks to my colleagues Dan O'Brien, Omri, Allison, Aaron, Anna, Molly, and Nicole uh, for all of their work pulling the briefing together today. Couldn't do it without them for sure. Uh, we also have three great interns who are helping us out this spring semester, Emily, Kylie, and Megan. So thanks for helping us uh, and uh, spending your spring semester with us. Um, and Troy, uh, you haven't been on camera today, but we couldn't do it without you. So thank you as well for uh, for being with us today. Um, Troy just popped up a survey. This is a link if you would have a few moments to take uh, to take our survey, we read every response we receive. If there's any issues you had with the live cast, the video, the audio, uh, if you have ideas for future panels, uh, anything like that, please, uh, we really encourage and, and really uh, appreciate when people uh, take the time to complete our survey. Um, we uh, will wrap up in just a moment, but before I do that, just want to plug our briefing next April 16th on demystifying ocean carbon dioxide removal, and that will be presented with our friends at World Resources Institute, or WRI. Uh, we have a new room and a new time, so if you've RSVP'd previously, be sure to check out the new time and date, or no, excuse me, new time and room. Uh, if you haven't RSVP'd yet, what are you waiting for? It's already 1031 on a Friday morning a couple days before the briefing, RSVP before it's too late. Uh, it's going to be a really, really great session. And it's never too late. Our briefings live in perpetuity on the website. You won't miss anything. But we'd love to have you there in person. On uh, May 1st, along with our friends at American Rivers, we will be presenting Dams in Every District, Challenges, Opportunities, and What's Ahead. And save the date for our Clean Energy Expo. Our Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo uh, will be July 30th. And that's something that we work on with the House and Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucuses. So um, I mentioned Mandy's name earlier. Mandy was one of our panelists uh, last, Mandy Mahoney at Building Technologies Office at DOE, so, or at ERE. So um, it's a great uh, way to pull everybody together across the clean energy sector and, and climate to talk about solutions. Uh, and uh, one last plug for climate change solutions. It comes out every, every two Tuesdays. It's a great way to keep up with everything we've got going on. So with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day, TGIF. Uh, have a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you back on the 16th with demystifying ocean carbon dioxide removal in person and online that one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.